Um, I just wanted to follow up on an earlier question. Uh, I guess given your expertise, I'm curious if you foresee the emergence of uh, cyber international cyber attack laws, almost like oh. the war crime laws and all that, um, and how you see that playing a role down the line. Yeah, that, that has been an effort that people have really, I, I mean, under the Obama administration, they push really, really hard for international law and norms. And you actually saw a group of people that um, were kind of international experts that got together and wrote this thing called the Talon Manual. There's the Talon Manual 1.0 and the Talon Manual 2.0, and these cyber experts all got together, cyber law experts, and wrote what they thought was the best cyber law. And some of it got is kind of kind of being followed, and some is not. I'm not very optimistic on the on the international law front. And the problem is the the Chinese and the Russians um, have no incentives right now to buy into these legal frameworks. And the U.S. and the Chinese and the Russians are are extremely opposed to their vision of what the internet should be. So I'm not optimistic. That said, this most recent statement between the US and the EU and NATO was the closest we've come to uh, a center of gravity of kind of Western states saying what they thought was appropriate and not appropriate. So I think we're moving to a point where maybe more states are willing to hold Russia or China's feet to the fire. Um, but I think it's a lot's going to depend on, on what actions the United States takes over the next few years. Um, when the solar winds hack occurred, you know, the Biden administration said, this is not acceptable. But we still were kind of lost with how to punish, right? And so, you know, I have small children. When I, when I tell them it's not acceptable, especially my, like, my revisionist little Putin kid, you know, he... <laughs> He knows, like, yeah, that she's not going to, like, follow through with that punishment, you know? So we got to figure out what are reasonable and credible punishments that can actually um, convince other states. And I actually think more of it has to come with, um, with being more assertive in taking out their kind of their, their counter cyber capabilities. So going after the Russian GRU, going after the Russian IRA, not waiting for a conflict or a big attack to go after them, just making it harder and harder for them to be able to conduct these activities in the first place. And that's more like a spy v spy, a little bit less like you know dropping bombs on each other. I thank you, Dr. Schneider, for being with us today. My question goes to what you had just said about whether you're optimistic about our engagement with the Russians in areas <laughs> of cooperation. Do you think we should be doing the same thing with the Chinese, at least to push things forward, or how optimistic would you be? Yeah, so you know, the Obama administration at the end of the administration made a really concerted effort towards um, changing Chinese cyber efforts about um, intellectual property. So. The, Biden, the Obama administration got together and said, we care a lot about the Chinese stealing intellectual property. And we think that is fundamentally different than some of these other cyber things. And so they focused on DO, the Department of Justice and the FBI and on economic sanctions and tough talk. I mean, he got together with Xi Jinping and said, hey, I know what you guys are doing and it's not OK. And for, year, for a few years, it looked like the Chinese were actually consolidating their cyber activity, becoming more responsible, taking less you know, um, cyber attacks for economic um, and intellectual property uh, rewards. And it's, it, I feel like it's been completely reversed in the last few years. So they're more assertive. They're using cyber proxies more. Um, and they are definitely back to uh, economic espionage. So what is, I don't know what, it's all tied together with the overarching foreign policy between the US and China. Um, so there's no cyber solution here. It, it comes down to a foreign policy solution. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not sure what that solution is going to look like. But over the next few years, how this relationship evolves will shape cyber. Cyber won't shape the relationship, I don't think. The relationship will shape cyber. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Uh, my question is sort of about some of the cybersecurity threats we see in the you know, civilian sphere, mm -hmm. where, you know, for example, uh, 
uh, TikTok has been banned from, I think, devices on the Department of State, uh, Department of Homeland Security, the military, yeah. you know, uh, countless devices, you know, in the government. And, you know, Biden's recent executive order uh, about a month or two ago uh, discussing, you know, foreign owned apps, you know, specifically talking about, you know, focusing on apps like uh, TikTok and WeChat and other Chinese yeah. owned apps. What do you think are kind of the merits to the Biden approach? Do you think Biden will ban these kinds of apps? And, you know, what distinctions would you draw between his approach and the Trump administration's? Yeah, I mean, the Trump administration, they flip-flopped on this one, right? So they came down really hard, said, we're going to ban it, and then kind of reneged. Um, so what's the threat, right? Why do we care about TikTok? I mean, this is like dancing. It doesn't, <laughs> who cares if the Chinese collect a lot of dancing videos, right? Um, the reason we care about TikTok is because it collects a lot of background information. So it collects a lot of user information that you have on your phone that you, sh you don't think you're sharing with TikTok. Um, and the concern is that you know, they're collecting uh, information on American citizens, but also that they are collecting information on Travis, for example, when he does his uh, TikTok videos. And, and that that will lead to information, sensitive information, about you know, um, aircraft carrier movement or something. It's a lot of data. Uh, a lot of data can be very powerful, and it can also just be a lot of a, a pain in the butt. Um, and so they have to develop algorithms that are able to find Travis um, and find when he's talking about something important. Um, so yes, there's a national security threat there. No, we don't know how good the Chinese are at parsing that data to actually translate into a national security asset. Even the OPM hack, for example, that was uh, you know, a few years ago, tons of information about US national security professionals. You know, it's been a few years. I, I haven't seen a huge change to US national security because of that OPM hack, besides like it being very annoying for me because my identity gets hacked all the time. Um, so is TikTok a national security threat? It could be. It hasn't shown that, but it, we're not sure it's there yet. What can we do about it? I mean, one option is like this banning it completely, but that really doesn't feel like the US way, right? Um, so I think it might be better instead to think about how do we regulate that so that the data lives, for example, in the United States. Um, the Europeans actually do this. So if you're using um, European, uh, if you're a Euro European citizen, depending on what country you live on, there might be rules where if I'm using TikTok or Facebook or whatever, that data lives in my country. The database is physically hosted in my country. And that might be a nice kind of medium where Yes, you know, foreign countries are able to create these apps um, that potentially take a lot of our information, but that that data is maybe like uh, lives in the United States and is administered by US citizens. So there might be kind of a, a happy medium here where we're still able to do our dancing videos, but not necessarily giving all the information to the Chinese. Um, you mentioned earlier in the presentation this concept of like the Iranians not being as good as like the Chinese or the yeah. Russians. So in con in like terms of skill, um, are we seeing like the United States needing either like a better skill set or like a larger worker supply to help with this kind of strategy or cybersecurity issue? Yeah, that's the number one resource in cybersecurity is talent. It's not it's not software, it's not hardware, it's talent. And the, there's a worldwide shortage of cybersecurity professionals. So the US knows this. And in fact, Chris Inglis, who's the new national cyber director, that's one of his kind of primary focuses. And then at first, the beginnings of his job is to create that cyber workforce. The US government's been investing. NSA has a program, uh, the National Security Agency has a program called the um, Centers for Academic Excellence, where they uh, basically give incentives to universities per, for providing a certain amount of cybersecurity education. And the idea that you're like just creating more cybersecurity professionals. Um, but that's still not producing enough talent. And it's not necessarily producing enough of the right talent. Um, so the US government right now is considering kind of what are the ways in which we can incentivize universities to provide more cybersecurity. Because actually, cybersecurity is not um, a preferred discipline within computer science. Um, universities are more likely to invest, for example, in artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Um, so how do we continue to invest in cybersecurity with the universities? The federal government can do a lot to invest in things like that. Um, and then, you know, 
finding ways to increase the overall cyber literacy of the workforce so that, you know, because most of the cyber vulnerabilities are us. There, you know, our passwords, there are not patching, there, I do all these, we all do these things, right? So if we can increase the basic cyber literacy, then you also decrease the amount of effort that you're having to take, you know, on a baseline level. So yes, huge cyber talent shortage, government knows it, they want to um, help um, increase the domestic supply. And then I think under the Trump administration, there was actually a really big decrease in the amount of external supply of cybersecurity professionals, so a cut down on immigration and visas. And I think that might change under the Biden administration because it, it might actually be impossible for the US to create enough cyber talent um, domestically. So it might be this is one of those situations where it's really, really useful to, um, to use the external kind of immigrant and foreign population to build up the US's cybersecurity. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah, my question. My question is just what exactly does a secure internet look like in contrast to our, I know that's a big question, but in contrast to our conceptions of a free internet, and do you see the potential for a future a desperate administration to ally with big tech to impose security measures that they otherwise would not be able to? Yeah, okay, two really big questions. <laughs> um, secure versus open. Let's just take the example of China, right? China has, um, there are limited access points outside China. So China controls its internet internally, um, which means that there's not an open and free flow of information within China and outside of China. The central government plays a large role in um, those internet gateways and what information comes in and out of them, and then censorship of, of actual information um, inside of China. Russia does something somewhat similar as well. So as opposed to the United States, where these internet gateways are not governed by the United States, um, and you can have free and open conversations. Um, and in general, you know, unless it's the social media companies, the government is actually not regulating most of your content online. Um, so it's a little bit of the difference. Now this question about big tech is, is really fraught right now. And I will say, you know, I, and I've been here a little bit, um, you know, at the end of the Obama administration, I think big tech was really reaching out to the Obama administration to be like, hey, we, we've got a problem. There's a lot of disinformation and misinformation occurring, and we don't really want to police it. Can you guys come up with a policy so that everyone gets policed the same way? And you know, as you as you guys know, that's a really complicated phenomenon about social medias and lib, you know, and liberty and uh, what what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And uh, the Obama administration kind of punted, um, and then we end up to where we are today where the social media companies are now all doing very different things and experimenting on their own, which leads to a wide variation of, of how they're thinking about information and information regulation. So you know, I, I, I bet they are, uh, the social media companies are interested in the government taking a more proactive role so that they don't, Facebook doesn't want, <laughs> Facebook doesn't want to be the bad guy. They want you all to love being on Facebook. Um, so they would prefer the U.S. government being the bad guy um, and them not having to do it. But the U.S. government, these are really, really complicated issues, and it probably is not something the U.S. government is going to do very quickly. So in the meantime, we have this kind of haphazard world we live in where um, we're literally learning and changing as the social media companies evolve and as legislation um, kind of counters and interacts with the social media companies. I don't know if the Biden administration is going to be able to to really sink their teeth into it and fix it in, in four years. That's pessimistic. Thank you. Um, so to the cyber outsider, it seems like there's kind of a growing proportion of the cyber workforce that's consultants and software engineers and kind of out of house talent. Do you think it's a problem that there is just not as much in house talent in the federal government that's working on, on these problems? And I guess I'm especially thinking of like the Jedi contract, which was huh. delayed and you know is kind of being ping ponged around because there's not, there's yeah. political issues sort of surrounding yeah. it that seem to come from these private private corporations. I mean, the government has a whole set of acquisition issues in general. Jedi is a, is a this, is, this is a, Jedi was a problem. For those of you who don't know, Jedi was this huge cloud computing um, contract that the DOD uh, had put out, like, I don't know, five years ago almost? And it was a sole source cloud. Uh, and they awarded it, but then it got contested. Um, and honestly, at this point, it, the technology is super outdated um, and should not 
be fulfilled anyway. But what you're getting to is they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't actually implement the newest technology because by the time they were like, had gone through all the legal hoops to implement the newest technology, it no longer, it was obsolescent, it was obsolete. So how does the US government deal with that, especially when it comes to cybersecurity? Uh, they have not so far. So we are running on early versions of Windows. Um, I mean, I was recently kind of on the phone with somebody and they were, we were talking about cloud uh, cybersecurity and the guy's like, I don't want to talk about cloud cybersecurity, I just want to get people on the cloud. Like we are so far behind that, I mean, we're not, it, we're nowhere close. So yeah, the US needs to rethink their total, the way they think about acquisition and technology. And if for any of you who have worked in the US government, you know that the IT platforms are horrendous and awful, and it seems kind of funny, but it also is a real detraction both for like attracting talent and then for the ability to function effectively. It's just one of the least efficient kind of IT companies out there via the US government. But I don't, unfortunately, I think I'm out of time because that's like, that could be a whole nother hour is uh, acquisition reform for technology. <laughs> um.